here's an image of what Spinosaurus aegypticus might have looked like 60, 72 million years ago. 72 million, <laughs> jeez, that's such a, what a concept. We think of antiques as hundreds and thousands of years, but this is a fossil remains that was left of Spinosaurus aegypticus. This is his tooth. It's likely a tooth that broke off while he was feeding. It would have been twice the length, meaning that it would have been another several inches longer. It would have looked more like a spoon on this end of it. Same conical shape down to the bottom and then it would expand out to a spoon shape. And uh, this is the business part of the tooth. You can see it's worn on the top from the abrasion of chewing on bones and whatnot. And what's very interesting, look at that. What's very interesting about this one is this little concave groove. And you know where that groove came from? Every time he bit down, the upper tooth would slide into that groove. <laughs> oh, that's great. That is really cool to see. Spinosaurus, you can, it's always classic. You see this kind of ridge in it and the corrugated texture on the surface. This specimen has been restored. Here you can see the restoration in the center, which is acceptable. It's 72 million years ago. It was left in the dirt, <laughs> so uh, left behind from this. This sediment's harder too, so it's all part of the restoration. Not bad though, it looks to be the, the same tooth on the top as it does on the bottom. These characteristic lines match up pretty well. So it was a broken tooth found in situ instead of two teeth found and then put together, which sometimes happens. You know, they're, they're not, I admit, they're sort of scientists there when they're collecting these. This was a, an animal that was uh, very prevalent uh, for the fossil record anyhow, it seems to be. Uh, he was a, the, the carnivores seemed to outnumber the herbivores in this formation. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Africa was attached to uh, South America, and there was a, a bretiating sea and shallow inlet, freshwater lakes, and uh, these guys would have been swimming around and feeding on whatever there is to feed at the time. Cretaceous, late Cretaceous, a lot going on. So he's finding some self plesiosaurs and fish, a lot of fish. Some shark periodically, I imagine. I don't know. Good question. Something for you to look up, see what he ate. But he didn't eat a lot. There wasn't a lot of land-dwelling herbivores like other parts of the world. So his diet must have been mostly from the marine. Although when you find the teeth, they're found in very red land deposited sediments. I say red because the iron in it is oxidized because of the rich oxygen that, that was abundant in the area when it was laid down, unlike the sediments in the sea where there's a very lacking of oxygen. And so the sediments are actually this color. So they didn't, they could have put it, the red sediment would have been better in there. Okay, and so that's Spinosaurus aegypticus and We'll put that one in back in this box. These are a lot of little toys that, uh, a little history here. Let's see, we're already done dinosaurs. Let's, uh, let's go into the sea. Uh, we're going to the Eocene epoch now. Oops, where is it? There we go. Uh, this is, um, I believe, Lamna Crato, which is Eocene found in the north of, uh, of uh, Morocco, in the back side of the Atlas, uh, anti-Atlas area. Um, I don't know what that thing is. But uh, it's a pendant, it's a nice one. Now typically pe people wear it in this fashion with the curved end forward, but that's the, um, the inside of the jaw, or what do they call it? The, uh, I forgot the words. 
Anyhow, this is what you'd see coming at you, the flat side. And so that's what that is. And these are denticles on the side. You develop those to uh, have a better bite. It wasn't a big animal, probably six to eight feet, which is substantial. Here they, let's see, 4.5 feet per inch. So yeah, about six feet, something. Actually, the measurement is across the top, that's right. So each inch equals four and a half feet. So that's about an inch and a quarter, six feet, yeah, across the top. I'm forgetting all this stuff. I used to have this right there. Here's another species that came later on, Lamna obliqua. Again, this is the back of the tooth, or the lingual part of the tooth because it's near the tongue, the linguus, I'm, I'm thinking. And it was probably a side tooth on the side of the, of the jaw. And again, we had the sharp edges here and the denticles. And this is all original sediment, the actual, all original, I didn't say sediment, all original bone that the animal created. You don't get much preservation of the whole animal because the rest of it's made out of cartilage which uh, decomposes fairly rapidly in the fossil record. So that's a beauty. Now this is, these are all found in, in southern Morocco in what we call a phosphate bed. A lot, of, uh, a lot of organic marine, shallow marine environments that deposited uh, lots of concretions of poop. <laughs> and these, if you can see it, these little white dots that are kind of rounded in the sediment that's poop, and that's phosphate rich. There's another fossil of something, looks like a shell almost, but you don't see many shells, but it does give a characteristic of a shell. But this is a tooth that was, was deposited in, it's all original tooth, it looks like it was restored as well, but still a nice job, and it's this is the actual sediment that was deposited in about 18 uh, to 22 million years ago. That's a good size animal now. We're talking a couple of inches across the bottom. So 10, 12 foot, good size. So that's, that's the fossil shark teeth. You got the pendants. And then let's look at, uh, oh, we get, let's go real recent. This is, the, this is woolly mammoth. And a lot of this was used for making jewelry and these are pieces that were left over. What I've been doing is drilling the top of it and using it as a pendant. It's the natural curvature of the tusk. Uh, these are several million, a million to a couple hundred thousand, maybe 300,000 found uh, in Siberia, this stuff came from. You can see the characteristic crotch hatching of the way the growth matter was taken. There's a crisscross pattern only Ivory will have that, and that has to be perpendicular to the length of the growth. And so you're seeing, I hope you're seeing it, now that crisscross texture. The coloration is due to mineralization. Uh, Vivianite, I believe, is the mineral that causes that. And is it a phosphate? Oh, I'd have to look that up. Um, speaking of phosphates, we do have one here. This is um, varicite it's from the Kirchhoff mine in Nevada, and it's a phosphate of aluminum. And I think there's probably some magnesium in there too, but uh, um, I'd have to get some more looking around to see the chemistry of it. In a quartz matrix, that's kind of cool. And then we've got the pyrite. Well, these specimens were found in the Peruvian Andes, about 14,000 feet height up in the Andes Mountains. It's an ore that was deposited when the Andes were forming. The mountains were forced up because magma migrating to the surface would force up the mountains and fracture them. That magma is cooling and at certain points it will release Sulfur. Sulfur is a very active element 
and wants to bond with any other metallic element it comes in contact with. And as it's migrating past just regular sediments, it will leach metallic elements out of it and bond with them. Depending on the chemistry of it, we have here, it's an iron sulfide, almost pure iron sulfide. Uh, you find a lot of times you find copper iron sulfides too. I don't have a specimen, but we'll find one for you. And these are all specimens from that same mine up in Wansala. But what's different about each one of them is the, ch the, the crystalline structure. You'll notice that they have multiple sides to each crystal. There's an individual crystal there. Those sides represent what we call a dodecahedron, a 12-sided equidistant crystal, which is kind of cool too that they form in that temperature. This is a moderate temperature. It'll also form in, in a cubic crystal, which is this lower, lowest uh, symmetry. It'll actually form cubic crystals just in metamorphic rock, actually. I don't know how good the pictures are for these. <laughs> Probably not very at all. But these are, these are all dodecahedral. Now here's a high temperature pyrite. This is a really rare specimen, so enjoy it. Um, you can see that the crystals are in what we call an octahedral shape. And they're bioctahedral, bipyramidal if you want to say. Um, this comes from a higher temperature. Wow, this it does that all on its own. Oh, the camera, I gotta get used to this. <laughs> Anyhow, there we go. And that's the highest temperature crystalline form of pyrite. And what temperature it is? Well, maybe you guys can look it up and find out. Um, Speaking of high temperature, we have these little nuggets. They look black and opaque, but if you hold them up to the light, and I'm wondering if you're gonna see this, they're transparent. Where is it? I can't see anything. <laughs> I wonder if it worked. Anyhow, you can do that all on your own. We find these just in this shape. They're called Apache teardrops. And this was found out in the Apache region at the border of Arizona, New Mexico, or California, in a, in a mine called the Perlite Mine. Perlite is that white material that you use to um, pot your soil with. And these are found in the perlite, little nuggets, and they form inside there. And it's actually a volcanic glass. It's a, an amorphous gel, it's just typically glass. But let's see what happens. Can I get this? It is so close. Is it going clear? Yeah, a little bit, maybe. Hopefully. So that's that's a Apache teardrop or obsidian. And let's see what else do we have? This wow, this is a fun one here. This mom might like. Where is it? This is opal. It's what we call a hydrophane opal because the opal's origin are in tiny vesicles left from a lava, like pumice. That's kind of flashy. I wonder how that looks. <laughs> it's probably terrible. Anyhow, uh, it's in silver. Well, the camera does that all on its own, or maybe that's me touching it. Um, Anyhow, they, it, uh, this one came from um, from Ethiopia. That's a new mine. We used to get a lot of the hydrophane opal out of um, north of Mexico City. There's a real famous mine there. It's not. It has similar physics and characteristics of the opal that comes out of Australia. Maybe a little more fragile because of its uh, its origins. Well, you have to keep it. Uh, Keep a little oil near it and stuff like that helps a lot, keeps it from crazing. So there you go. Oh, there's one other specimen that you're going to find out about when I tell you about it that um, should be exciting. Oh, here we forgot one. Ah, this is a really cool one. 
is going to be a long video. This is a fossil of a squid-like animal. He would have darted around in the sea, something like that. I wonder if you're even seeing it. Okay, well, we're back to that magnified zone. So he would, why is it going magnification? Hmm. What the hell? Why is it doing that? Oh, let me try doing another video. I don't know. Maybe she found that chicken. Maybe she found that chicken.